Hello, and welcome to Women with AI, the podcast dedicated to amplifying the voices and perspectives of women in the field of artificial intelligence. We'll cover topics from career development to tech breakthroughs, focusing on the unique challenges and successes of women in this rapidly evolving sector. I'm your host, Jo, and every episode, I'll be asking a new interviewee about their experiences and the impact and opportunities for women working with AI. It's my honor today to welcome Dr. Sarah Morgan onto the podcast. Sarah has a background in theoretical physics and is currently looking at using AI to predict mental health conditions. So I'm really looking forward to learning a lot from speaking to her today. But before we jump into our conversation, let me tell you a little bit more about our guest. Dr. Sarah Morgan is a senior lecturer in healthcare engineering based at the School of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences at King's College London. She leads a research group which focuses on developing AI and data science approaches to understand and predict mental health conditions such as schizophrenia. To that end, Dr. Morgan uses a range of different data types with a particular focus on speech data and brain magnetic resonance imaging. Prior to joining King's, Dr. Morgan led the AI for Brain Sciences group at the University of Cambridge. She holds a PhD in theoretical physics from the University of Cambridge Physics Department and co-founded the Cambridge Women in Physics group while she was there. She also holds a master's degree in physics from the University of Exeter. So Dr. Sarah Morgan, welcome to Women with AI. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No, it's a pleasure. Well, all of that sounds incredibly impressive and really, really cool. And did you ever think you'd be doing this when you were a little girl? Um, no, I think it was sort of when I was 15 or 16 that I got interested in physics um, and dad decided that's what I wanted to study at university. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it sort of all, all kind of went from there. So that's how you, you got here. So just maybe you can sort of explain all that in like really simple terms for everyone listening that might not know what theoretical physics is or how you've sort of gone from healthcare engineering to AI. So yeah, can you give us a sort of introduction to you, please? Sure. Um, so, so as you said, I lead a research group that's really uh, trying to develop AI and data science tools um, to try and predict and understand different mental health conditions. Um, well, we do that with a range of different data types like brain images and, and short excerpts of patient speech. Um, and and just in terms of how I got there, I'm a physicist by background um, and I wasn't actually using AI during my PhD, um, but I was looking for patterns in sort of large, messy, real world data sets um, and found that that was something that I really enjoyed doing. Um, and then I think towards the end of my PhD, I wanted to do that, um, continue doing that um, in a way that was a bit more applied. Um, and healthcare just seemed like such an interesting application area. Um, and. I got interested also in, in studying the brain, um, and particularly studying the brain as this sort of really complex network of different brain regions and how they, they those regions work together. Um, and, and yeah, sort of got interested in that and, and started looking at, at mental health as, as an application area. Um, I think the other thing that I really learned during my PhD um, was around working with people from a wide range of different backgrounds. Um, so though I was a, a theoretical physicist, I was working with chemists and biologists and experimental physicists. Um, and those are very much skills that I use now as well. Um, I think AI generally is this very interdisciplinary area, particularly some applications of, of AI to different fields like healthcare. Um, and so now my work involves working a lot with clinicians, also people with lived experience of mental health conditions. Um, as well as obviously other AI researchers and, and researchers in other areas like linguists. I've sort of been learning as my sort of journey into AI has started about the kind of biases that there are. And I know I've spoken about that in all the episodes probably leading up to this one. And it just basically blew my mind when I found out that women hadn't been included in medical research up until, well, I think it was, was it America? It was probably here as well until about 1993. And this is just it's just blowing my mind that it's just most research is done on on men and so how have you is that kind of what inspired you or is that what you'd found out or is that i don't know am i really generalizing <laughs> so i think definitely it's a really sort of important point to raise um i remember reading invisible women um by caroline credo perez um uh, some years ago now and just thinking yeah this is really really incredible the the yeah women just were so excluded in these different areas 
um, things like the mobile phone as well. I mean, not just healthcare, but, but things like technology, mobile phones being quite large. Um, and yeah, it's really hard as a woman sometimes, like with a small hand to be able to yeah, reach the buttons that you need to. Um, yeah, sort of things like that, isn't it? And, and obviously in healthcare it has real, real implications. For, for women's health um, and for, for risk of different conditions and so on. Um, yeah, it's really important. So the data you're looking at, do you make sure it is equally split with men and women or does it depend what you're looking into? So we try to make sure that we're really representative of the population that we're looking at. Um, and so, I mean, different mental health conditions can have different prevalences. Um, so I work a lot on schizophrenia, um, which is actually more prevalent for men. Um, particularly sort of younger men, um, particularly men from um, uh, men who are black um, or from other ethnic minority groups. And so, it, yeah, we, we try to really make the, the research that we're doing representative of the population um, that's affected by the particular mental health condition. Um, if you look at something like depression, um, I say most of my work tended to focus more on schizophrenia. But depression, for example, um, and we have done a little bit of work on that in the past, um, is particularly prevalent for women, um, particularly in that sort of 14 to 20 or so years age range, um, that, that we see a higher rate, higher prevalence for women. Um, and so we try to, you have to really make sure that we're obviously having a, a sort of diverse representation of patients in, in the data that we're working with. Um, and particularly representing the, the populations affected. How has AI changed it? So were you using AI at the beginning of when you started looking into this, when you sort of transitioned from, from the theoretical physics into AI and healthcare? What, how did you yeah, start to use it? Yeah, so I started to get interested in AI at that point um, and started to use um, initially kind of quite basic AI algorithms that, or, or different methods, um, AI methods that, that were of a yeah good one to focus on at that point um i think i think sort of more generally in terms of how ai is changing the field um historically mental health conditions have generally just been diagnosed by by looking at symptoms um so by clinicians talking to patients asking them what symptoms they have and then making decisions about sort of different treatments and so on on the basis of, of those conversations um, and that's quite different to many other areas of medicine, um, where we have the blood tests or different images that are collected and so on, like scans and, and so on. Um, and so that, um, something that we're really, I think as a field, psychiatry is really keen to move towards more of these, um, sort of biomarkers, um, sort of biological markers that could perhaps help to inform different clinical decisions um, and I think AI has a role to play um, in helping us to get to that point. Um, so a lot of my work for example is with brain images um, and if clinicians look at, at brain images say from someone with schizophrenia um, and someone who doesn't have schizophrenia you can't really tell by looking at those brain images uh, as a human um, sort of which person has schizophrenia and which person doesn't. Um, but we're finding that that computational models, so by by training AI, um, these AI models are able to to spot that difference. Um, and so the way that we think about using AI in my work is really around um, trying to to use AI to give clinicians extra information um, from, for example, brain scans that that clinicians wouldn't otherwise have available to them. So it's really about giving extra information to clinicians um, and and not about replacing clinicians with AI. Um, Because I think that's something that I do a lot of work with people with lived experience of mental health conditions. um, And that's something that they always really highlight as a concern. um, If AI is actually really used to replace clinicians, um, because people with mental health conditions often really value the therapeutic interactions that they have with those clinicians um, and that human to human interaction is really important. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, because you wouldn't want to just go and see a robot doctor, but you're coming to see the clinician and it's just that, as you say, it's a tool to help them. So you still need 
that human input. Yes, absolutely. Something that I see as a tool yeah. um, rather than a sort of endpoint in itself. That all sounds really exciting right now, but how do you, what exciting developments do you think will sort of come from this? Like, how do you, how would you like to see it sort of change or get better? I mean, do you think it will get better? Do you, you're not in the camp that think, well, it will take over. It's like we need to keep it as a tool. So, how can it, I don't know, what, what developments are you looking forward to? So, I think for me, the real sort of challenge for AI is can we use AI in a way that really benefits patients' lives? Um, and I see sort of two different routes to doing that. One is if we can use AI to better to predict different individual trajectories. So basically being able to use AI to maybe feed brain scans into AI um, and for the AI to be able to say, actually, this treatment might be better than this one because of this particular brain connectivity pattern that, that this person has. Um, so really sort of trying to help inform different treatment choices um, and we're, we're definitely not there um at the moment and and there's quite a lot of work to do to get there um so see so yeah, i think that's sort of one area that we're, we're really trying to work towards um the other area which where i think ai can potentially help us to have an impact is also in better understanding of these mental health conditions um because we're still I think still fairly early on in our understanding of what actually causes these mental health conditions, what, um, um, for example, what brain regions are involved, what combinations of different brain regions um, and connectivity between different brain regions is important. Um, And if we understand those things better, and I think AI can help us to do that, um, then that could potentially lead to new treatment options. um, Because if we know for example, what parts of the brain to target, then then that would help with developing drugs. So are there other people doing this as well? Because I guess it's, if it's just your data and the data that you've got the time to collect, how does it go into like, into, do you share that data or are you working with other universities or other departments to get more data? How does it, how does that all kind of fit together? So I don't collect data myself. Um, so I tend to work with, uh, with hospitals and work with hospitals around Europe um, and worldwide who are collecting data. Um, and then I tend to be on the sort of data analysis side of things. Um, so building computational models that are, that are analyzing that data. Um, and what the field has found is that you need quite a lot of data. I mean, it's generally true for, for these AI models that they're quite data hungry um, and where you see sort of real success, real success stories for AI um, at the moment, those are generally areas where there's been really huge amounts of data available. So like with the large language models, um, which are, are very prominent and, and talked about at the moment, they've had access to huge amounts of data from the internet. So lots of kind of written data that, that people have shared on the internet, um, which is what's been able to make those models so successful, the sort of size of those data sets. Um, and so for us, I think what the field's been learning kind of generally is that you need to sort of share data between different hospitals um, to get the sort of sample sizes that you need. Um, historically, people were maybe collecting, you know, data from maybe 20 or 30 people. Um, and that was, a you know, it, it's hard to scan large numbers of patients and to recruit patients and them um and so yeah really by combining different data sets and, and by working together we can get a lot further and do you get to say what data you want or what's missing because just thinking as you say about the kind of or like um, the invisible women book and about women being mess, missed out on research, do you get to say, well, actually, we need to look at, at these ages and then when, you know, we need to look at women at certain times of their menstrual cycle as well? I mean, do you go that deep into it? Because I'm guessing that, you know, with things like depression and things that maybe are more prevalent in women at certain times or and men at other times, a lot of that could be all down to, to hormones and the way that our bodies fluctuate. Uh, you know, throughout your your cycle, so every sort of you know four months or uh, four months, four weeks or so. I mean, do you do you get yeah to to ask for those di- or to try and encourage that data to be collected, or is it? Or yeah, what's it dependent on? 
I think these are really sort of decisions that are made at the level of the field. So I guess the way it works is that uh, different sort of consortia of scientists come together to collect data. And at that point, they decide kind of what's important. What are we going to prioritize? Um, and it's often difficult because, you know, you don't want to, you don't want the burden on the patient to be too high. So you don't want to be sort of giving someone questionnaires that are going to take them days and days to complete. Like you see, there has to be some sort of choice often around sort of what to include and what not to include. Um, but, but yeah, it's sort of done at, at a kind of consortium level where lots of different scientists with different research interests. Um, will come together and try to sort of reach a consensus on what's most important to collect. The other area that I, I talked to quite a bit about brain imaging, the other area where I work quite a bit is on speech data. Um, I think that's interesting because historically that's data that really hasn't been collected actually. Um, so as a field, we've spent a lot of time collecting, collecting brain images from patients and actually not speech. Um, whereas you'd think that speech in many ways is sort of easier to collect than brain images because you don't need a huge MRI scanner to do it, just recording equipment and, and you can do that. Um, but I think that the reason that speech data hasn't been collected so much is because historically people didn't really have the, the method to test. It was very time consuming to, to transcribe the speech and then to analyze it and you needed a sort of linguist and, and real sort of expertise um, in, in the different sort of linguistic models. Um, and, and I guess that's another area where AI is really helpful um, because we can now, um, trans automated transcription is still far from perfect, um, but we're getting to a point where we can transcribe the data in an automated way um, and also analyze it um, in a much more automated way. Um, so I think the AI is also sort of helping um, to or, or sort of changing our priorities around what data to collect as well. So because it can pick up on the, the tone of voice. Is that what you mean? Is that the data that you're collecting? So not just what people say, but how they say it or the speed? Yeah, so we're interested in both um, the sort of content of the speech and also the sort of acoustics. So yeah, how people are saying what they're saying. Um, and it looks like... Um, so sort of altered language use is, is often a symptom of schizophrenia, for example. Um, so people um, can sometimes talk in a way that's quite difficult to understand. Um, if, if they have schizophrenia and if they're in sort of chronic, um, uh, so a particularly uh, symptomatic stage. Um, and so, so that's sort of why we became interested in, in speech for schizophrenia particularly. Um, and yeah, it looks like there's sort of signal both in what people are saying and also in how they're saying it. That's amazing. And like, so sort of thinking back to when you said it, that um, the data that's been collected is, uh, you know, decided upon by whoever's collecting it or what they think is important. I guess that's where we have to hope that it's not just a sort of like completely male dominated field and sort of making sure that it is kind of a, you know, a spread of different. Oh, different gender, you know, male, female, different ethnicities. Because I guess to each, otherwise it, it's just what they think is important, not what maybe is best for everyone. Yes. It's also really about involving both um, people with lived experience of these conditions and clinicians in those um, in those discussions. Um, because, because people with lived experience often have really great ideas about what they think is relevant. Um, and they have that experience to really know. Um, and also clinicians um, can help sort of say what might be able to be collected in clinic because it's one thing of having a tool that works great in a sort of research environment. Um, but if you can't actually ever collect that data in clinic, then it's not, yeah, it's not really going to have that real world impact. Um, so there are lots of different considerations that you have to, yeah, you have to take into account there. So I imagine that, um, that physics is, is quite a male dominated field. Anyway, how have you navigated being a woman in this field? So many different things I could say about that. Um, it, I think often the challenges that women face in sort of male dominated fields like physics now are often these sort of unconscious 
biases rather than sort of overt discrimination. Um, I think often the sorts of unconscious biases that I've experienced are things like someone assuming that a male colleague wrote a piece of code that I wrote just because he's male and therefore they think that's more likely um, or yeah, kind of giving more credit to male colleagues. Um, there's quite a lot of literature showing that research papers by men tend to be rated more highly than research papers by women, even if it's the same research paper and you just change the name at the top of it. Like, And, and similarly with, with CVs and so on. Um, Professor Danny Bassett in the US has done quite a lot of work around sort of citation practices and how they're sort of different between different genders, um, which is really interesting. Um, and that's about in terms of how to navigate that. I think often what people say is around sort of kind of not being afraid to to voice your achievements and to remind people of your credentials because that's sort of because they do have these sorts of unconscious biases. And we all have these unconscious biases, not yeah, it's not just men, but women as well have, have these unconscious biases sort of built into us, don't we? Um so I think that's one thing. I think also but but it's difficult, isn't it? And lots of us don't really want to kind of shout about our achievement or to just get on with doing the job. Um but I think the other thing that that people can do is sort of amplify other women's voices in meetings. Um, so, yeah, sort of repeating something that someone said or reminding people that a uh, female colleague had that idea 10 minutes ago in a, in a kind of very um, uh, sort of really friendly and, and nice way. But, but, yeah, sort of trying to amplify those voices, I think, is another thing. I think the other thing that's really important to say is that these things aren't just true for women, but also for um, for black people, people from the LGBT community, etc. So there are lots of groups that are affected by these unconscious biases. Um, and intersectionality is also really important. Um, so black women face these unconscious biases in a way that's more than just the sum of being black and being a woman, um, but it's sort of extra and kind of sort of cost to that and that i think for me that is my biggest worry about ai that it is because it is only learning on all that historical sort of unconscious bias or that that we don't really realize that we're doing until it's pointed out and then you're like well actually yeah you know why why are you thinking that just because he wrote it is better than if she wrote it and 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 that's the sort of bit that i'm hoping we can sort of overcome i mean i mean yeah, that seems to me like the biggest challenge. Um, I mean, I don't, but what's the biggest challenge that you're finding when sort of applying AI to the mental health research? Does does gender or bias come into it or are you just sort of, because you're just looking at the brain or the speech, you're not thinking about that? But as you say, if it's if it's more prevalent in men or in women, I d yeah, I don't know. How do, you, how do you navigate that? So I think these are definitely things that you have to, keep in mind um and they're things that that we we check um turn up an algorithm and then check does it have this bias or that bias um and like i say working with people with with lived experience can help you to sort of identify which biases might be particularly important um and things yeah really the, i mean obviously there's things like gender and an age and so on that you you do just check for um, but sometimes people have ideas for other things to include there. Um, I think the, for me, the thing that that I think we have to be really careful about with AI um, is that it's not able to replace humans, um, particularly when making high stake decisions. There are sort of some areas where AI can and is already being used very widely and generally areas where they're not sort of very high stakes decisions. It's kind of quite routine, repetitive things. And their AI actually is already really quite prevalent. I mean, for us, the sort of technical example is that we often want to segment the brain into areas of different tissue types. So you get a brain image and there are different types of tissues in the brain. Um, and we want to say which parts of the image are which tissue type. And AI is already really helpful there. Um, because historically people had to go and kind of draw onto these images 
um, kind of lines of where this tissue ends and that one doesn't. Um, and yeah, obviously that's really laborious. Um, and AI can can help with that very easily. Um, so there's sort of things like that where they're kind of really easy wins for AI. Um, but then the things that we're starting to think about now are much more complicated. Um, and if you're thinking about like making a um, making a decision about what treatment someone should do should go on to for a condition like schizophrenia, um, then that decision really has to be made by a clinician. Um, and it's yeah, really just about using AI to help with that decision. Um, yeah, so I guess that's that's the thing that I'm generally most most concerned about in in the work that I'm doing. I guess, and from the the sort of patient side of it as well, you probably feel a bit happier if you know that yeah, a human or a clinician has actually had a had a say in it, and yeah, you're not just getting the the information straight from AI. It's definitely being looked at. Yeah, yeah, it's important for a whole host of reasons. I mean, also just around taking responsibility. That AI can't take responsibility in the way that a human can take responsibility for making decisions. Um, and the sort of value of these therapeutic interactions that, that we were talking about earlier. And so going back to the kind of like male-dominated field of, of physics, because you, as, um, um, as mentioned in the, well, when I introduced you, you set up the Cambridge Women in Physics group. How did that How did that come about? And is it still going? Yes. Um, so there's a group that I set up uh, about 10 years ago now um, with Dr. Hannah Stern, um, who's now a lecturer at Manchester University and a really fantastic experimental physicist there. Um, and and I think our motivation for setting up the the group originally was just that the Cambridge University of Physics Department is quite large and back sort of 10 years ago there were a number of women who were in sort of different groups of the department but they were quite isolated in those groups um, and didn't really have so many opportunities to meet each other um, and what we wanted to do was sort of build build a space where people could could meet each other and could then support each other um, which I think is really important for women who are in this sort of male-dominated environment um, and yeah so that was our sort of motivation for, for creating the group and, and yeah, it is still going 10 years later um, so I think there was definitely a yeah sort of a need for that um, it's gone through excessive kind of different leadership and and different students involved with it over over the intervening ten years. Um, but yeah, it's really nice to see it still going strong. Fantastic. Well, that's kind of one of the reasons that um, we started doing this podcast as well. It's just you know it's to amplify the voices of women and it's to support each other and just sort of get that message out there that you know. It, this it shouldn't be a male-dominated field. You know, it is you know open to women, and we need to kind of jump in. And as you say, I know that quite often, you know, as women, we do just think, well, I'm just going to get all of it, and I'm not going to shout about it. I'm, obviously, I've done this. People should just recognise that and realise that. And it, it's that kind of, I don't know, maybe shouting a little bit louder that what about everything that we've achieved, and especially you know in all the work that that you're doing and and looking at all this, you know, all the ramifications of that, and just you know, incredible. So it's. Yeah, it, I mean, is AI must be sort of part of everything that you do now? Quite a lot of what I'm doing, yes. And I think it's going to continue to be. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really exciting at the moment, actually, because we've got so many sort of new AI techniques and the field is moving so quickly, which is a, a challenge also, definitely a big challenge. Um, but, but I think it is an exciting time, particularly with the advent of these more sort of generative AI techniques where AI is actually generating data um, rather than just being used to analyze data. So if people want to learn more about everything that you've told us or um, sort of get involved um, with doing anything, is there any 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 recommendations that you have, any, things to, uh, to any sort of websites to visit or, or how they can get in touch with you? I think LinkedIn is probably the best place. We'll show that. Brilliant. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's been really interesting to speak to you. Um, I just wish you every success with everything you're doing. And we'll probably have to get you back on the show in, in a year or so or something and just sort of find out about all the developments that have taken place and how it's changed. Um, Dr. Sarah Morgan, thank you for coming on Women with AI. Thank you for having me.